G'day you mob, Pete here from Aussie English, how's it going? Today I've got a special episode for you where the tables are being turned. The tables have been turned and I'm the one being interviewed by Martin Rufo who works for inspiringed.com. So these guys recently contacted me and were asking if they could interview me about changing careers later in life, how I ended up doing podcasting after so much time spent being trained as a scientist. So, you can check out the link below, go to their Facebook page or go to their website, inspiringed.com if you are interested in being educated, receiving courses in any kind of area. They've got heaps of interesting stuff on there, so go check those out. Anyway, without any further ado, guys, let's just get into today's interview where the subject is me and Martin Rufo is the impressive and uh, funny interviewer who I got to spend a bit of time with and who will be on the podcast soon where the tables will have been turned again and he'll be getting interviewed. Anyway, let's go. We on. <laughs> Hi, hello everyone. My name is Martin from Inspiring It and here joining us today is Pete Smithson from Aussie English. Now, changing career paths reinventing oneself happens frequently out there for for whatever reason people need to leave need or want to leave behind years of experience of uh, um, experience in an industry years of study take a 45 degree turn and start all over again i i personally admire those people i think it's very gutsy it takes a lot of courage and pete uh, has done it all himself and is here today with us to share his experience changing career paths, why changing career paths, uh, what it takes, how do you know it's a right move, the right time, is there a secret to succeed? Well, stay with us for the next 10, 15 minutes and hopefully Pete will have the answer to all those questions. Pete, thank you once again for joining us today. Let's start with your current business, Pete. Um, tell us a little bit about Aussie English. What is it? Uh, how does it work? Um, who is it aimed at? What services it provide? My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Martin. Um, so, Aussie English is an online platform. It's a podcast, YouTube channel, and um, yeah, online website where people can sign up for memberships. You know, there's paid content, there's free content, but it's aimed at exposing English as a second language learners to content from Australia, specifically Australia, so that they can wrap their their head around the unique language that is Australian English. But more than that, the focus has become on exposing them to the culture, to news and current affairs, to our history, so that if they are, you know, migrating to the country or really trying to integrate into life in Australia, that they learn more than just the English and they get more of, yeah, the, the content around history, culture, news, and they can, you know, develop connections with people and understand what it's like to be, you know, quote unquote, an Australian. <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. So, uh, any listeners out there, any viewers uh, will be forgiven for thinking that you've got a background on teaching, on education, but the, the reality is quite different to that. Tell us, tell us a little bit about your background. <laughs> I have a little bit of teaching education in terms of teaching biology. I used to be a um, prac supervisor when I was at um, Melbourne University, but yeah, my background's in science. I was an evolutionary biologist by training, so I did my <laughs> my undergraduate degree in science, so that was ecology and marine biology, and then I did a master's in um, evolutionary biology of Australian goannas, and then I did a PhD, a doctorate in the evolutionary origins of Australian rats. So, we have 70-odd <laughs> species of native Australian rodents, and I was interested in working out, my PhD was about how are they related to one another and what can that tell us about how they've moved into different environments you know, the deserts, the rainforests, the temperate forests, where did they, did they start in the desert, then get into the rainforest? Was it the other way around? So, it was trying to piece together their history in Australia. Wow. Okay. How many years of his studies was that? I think 12. 12 <laughs> Give or take. <laughs> Mum will be very happy about that. Hey, so how do you go from a PhD on biology to also English? What, what took you there? <laughs> oh, man, that's a long story. You might need 15 minutes for that. But basically, oh. when I was doing the PhD, I needed something to distract me because I was like getting close to, you know, killing myself with just doing one thing for so long and needed a distraction. I had like come out of a relationship, was a little bit overweight and decided to get into fitness. 
and then started um, training at an MMA gym doing um, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And I met a lot of people there, all these foreigners from overseas that were tended to be students in Melbourne uh, training at the gym. And I got to make all these friends from France, from Brazil, from Argentina, from China, from Singapore. And they all tended to have one thing in common, which was that they were in Australia and that they were learning English and they spoke many languages, usually two or three. So I got a little bit embarrassed when I first started there, met them and realized how bi or trilingual they were and wanted to sort of revitalize my French from high school. So I dived into, you know, online learning of languages, you know, doing Duolingo to begin with and then getting into other content, podcasts, YouTube channels and fell in love with a podcast called Francais Authentique, Authentic French by right. a guy called Johan Techfac. And I remember ranting and raving about this podcast and how good it was because he was sharing his life experiences, his, you know, self-help kind of advice, the French language, his history, culture, everything about France. And I was like, find something like that about Australia or about English in general, whether it's Britain or America. And use that if you're having trouble with English because they kept coming to me, my friends, and saying, we have tr a lot of trouble with um, Australian English. We've noticed you've sort of picked up French. What's your advice? And so, I, I kept hearing that quite a bit from my friends and was like, I had a little bit of experience in podcasting when I was doing science as a, my master's degree. I'd been on a podcast a few times to talk about science stuff and was like, well, I know how to, you know, have a studio like this, use a microphone, record it and edit it. And so, thought, well, I can do what um, Johan from Francais Authentique has done. He has no background in teaching either. He just creates the content. And then I remember the first episode was me effectively introducing myself in Royal Park, sitting on a dead tree, just talking for 10 minutes. And that was episode number one. And then, yeah, now we're at like 790, I think now. So, it just sort of slowly built over the past five years since then. Amazing. Amazing. So here, here you are now. How many years have you been running Aussie English for? So I think if we go back, the first content that I posted on the podcast is February two thousand fifteen. I'd have to go check again, but about right. five years, I would say, almost, right. maybe almost six years. There you go. But about yeah, years. originally, I, sorry. Yeah, about five years, nearly five years. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, it's crazy to think about that now. So right, five six years. Yeah. Right, and in those um, in those five years, obviously, you just explained you, you don't have a, a background in teaching. You haven't done any teaching studies or any degrees. You don't really need it for the kind of for the for, for the for podcast for the service that you you are offering. But have you ever thought about hey, furthering your studies on on on, on teaching uh, teaching English and being able to perhaps further your your current business? That's a good question. I, I was thinking for a long time of doing a TOEFL course or something, but then I sort of came around and I thought maybe that's going to pollute me in terms of um, making me like everyone else who teaches English online. Maybe my unique, you know, fact, uh, again, sort of tooting yeah. my own horn is the fact that I come at it from sort of a layman's, you know, um, non-specialized kind of way when I'm creating the content. And I it's one of those things I do try and be wary. I don't consider myself a teacher per se. It's more a content creator where I give you guys access to the materials, you know, free stuff, the paid stuff, and you guys ultimately go away and use that however you want to improve your own, um, you know, language skills or whatever it is. So, yeah, but I would definitely, I was definitely considering it for a while, but it yeah. seemed to be a big, I would have to take time out of doing what I'm doing now as a full-time job in order to do that. And I don't know how much, it would help. The other thing there is that a lot of my followers and, and you know, students for better, um, for need of a better word, I think are really, really advanced learners because I don't really dumb anything right. down and I don't really teach any of the basic sort of stuff. One, because I'm not a teacher, but two, I had a lot of people telling me when I was creating content, uh, don't, don't go easy on us, make it like natural, hard, you know, just, just how you would speak normally, the kind of grammar you would use, everything like that. Don't, don't dull it down. And so it's kind yeah. of um, made life easier at the same time. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just that makes sense. Use the content, and put it out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So y y you left well and truly your PhD on biology behind. You are, you know, on this path of um, running uh, Aussie English. Did you ever have any doubts? Did you uh, did you ever go? Actually, this is this is not it's not working. Should I should I go back to what I was doing before? Uh, did, did you ever have Man, a moment like that? 
Hundred percent, hundred percent. So uh, when I was finishing my PhD, for the first three years, my PhD went for I think what would it be? One, two, three, four, five years. For the first three and a half years, you get a stipend, a um, you know, money from the government. It's about twenty five thousand dollars a year, so you know, four hundred and fifty dollars a month, uh, a fortnight or a week. That's a week, nine hundred a fortnight. And I remember that ran out, and I had to get another job. I was working at a cafe. And then I started doing Aussie English on the side and that started bringing in, you know, I think the very first month I made $75 and I was just like, oh, wow, you know, like I made my, I know. And then within, I think it, within about a year of doing it, just as I was sort of having to make the choice, maybe a year and a half of uh, what am I going to do after the PhD? It was making a thousand, two thousand dollars a month. And I was like, well, I'm making more money than my original uh, wage at the cafe that I was working at. And more than the stipend that I was on, the scholarship that I was on. So, it's obviously enough to get by for now. Maybe I just give it a go for a couple of years. And worst case scenario, I can try back into science somewhere doing, you know, what, what I was doing previously. And so, yeah. effectively, I did that and then just didn't look back. You know, it just kept sort of the grind yeah. kept going. Money kept slightly increasing month to month to month and eventually yeah. became more than what I would probably be earning if I was doing if working full-time scientist. So, there you are. Fantastic. So, um, I had to hedge my bets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well done. No, amazing. <laughs> Why are you, you succeeded? You are, you're, you're, you are succeeding. Um, what do you think has been the base of your success? Why, why do you think you've succeeded? What, is, it, is it a skill, an attribute? A lack? Uh, I think, you know, I don't like tooting my own horn, but I think one of it is like just pushing, 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 pushing. You just keep going and throwing SHIT at a wall and seeing what sticks and then yeah. just being like, okay, I'll keep doing that and then I'll reassess again and then keep doing that. So, learning to pivot as well. I read a lot of those um, startup kind of books when I was first being started to learn about things like, you know, minimal viable products and pivoting and everything like that. And I think that really helped where it was just keep going, try different things, put things out there to be bought by people, get feedback, reassess, and then do it again. And so, I've just kind of followed that that step. It, it's it's easy to come in though now and sort of see it and think, wow, you just crushed it straight out of the gates. You did really, really well. But it's been a massive grind for the last okay. five years. So it, it yeah. is something where it's been just enough increase every single month to be like, this is working. Um, so yeah, but I think it's just that continuing. Just be just be ruthless in terms of trying new things and just continuing month to month to month to month to month. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Look, Especially also with content creation. Content creation yeah. in particular. <laughs> Oh, so that, that must be incredibly challenging. You had to create new content constantly. And uh, I've, I've, sus I've subscribed myself to your email database. And, you know, I'm getting constant, not constant, but I'm getting, I'm getting frequent <laughs> emails with different content. And I'm like, how is he, how is putting all this together? I, I bet there's a lot of uh, automation. Well, five years worth of content. <laughs> so I'm pointing you at all the old stuff. It's not just new. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Look, I was also going to ask you to, um, if someone is currently contemplating uh, taking a career change, changing paths, what would you recommend? So someone is nervous, perhaps a little bit unsure. Do you have a bit of advice to that person? I think you're just giving us one, you know, just throw stuff at the wall, see what it sticks and, 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 and navigate, navigate it that way. But is there any other word of wisdom that you can share with, with us? I think it's a difficult one to answer because everyone's situation is kind of different. And, and of so, it depends what your personal situation is. I was doing science for a long time because it seemed like it was all I could do. I got into it because I loved it, um, you know, the intellectual pursuit of learning about animals and evolution and, and just science in general. But then it ended up becoming a thing where it was like, well, I can't, get, I can't really get a job with an undergraduate degree, so I'll do a master's. Can't really get a job with a master's, I'll get a PhD. Can't really get a job with a PhD. And I was like, this is so boring, I'm over this. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I realized pretty quickly that I didn't really enjoy the work itself right. and that I was looking for something. I wanted to be paid for fulfillment effectively. I wanted to feel good about my job, that I was helping other people, that I woke up every single day um, making a difference in the world. And whilst science, you can do that, it's definitely much more of you're on your own at a desk and you don't really get much feedback from the rest of the world that you're doing a good job, pat on the back. You don't have many interactions with 
um, you know, other people compared to what I was getting with content creation where on a daily basis, you know, you're receiving comments about, you know, this is great. I needed this. I went for a job interview. They noticed this, you know, the, the thanks all the time and the appreciation and the fact that, you know, you're helping people. So as soon as, as soon as I noticed that that was happening, I was like, wow, this is way more fulfilling than <laughs> chasing the science career. Even if it pays less, like I would almost do this for free compared to science where I'd be like, you're going to have to pay me quite a bit to continue doing this. And I don't think it's a scientist isn't really going to get a good wage. That so, was that was the key thing of working out but, uh, what job, where am I wanting to go ultimately with regards to fulfillment and happiness and what I'm doing and being proud of what I'm doing and making a difference. And so, if, you've got, if you're stuck at a rock and a hard place of like, am I chasing a job that I think I need to get that I don't particularly enjoy, but the money's there? And then you've got another option of this is something I really love. It's going to make a difference in the world. You know, I get to meet other people who are amazing, interact with them and help them. I would be like, you have to decide how much the money and the grind is and the, you know, the job that you're not necessarily going to like as much is worth compared to um, helping people. But again, you can't really do it for free. So you need yeah, to right. find that, that balance. You need to find a way to get paid to be really happy effectively. So yeah. but yes, I would yes, say give it a go. Chase, chase the happiness first and hopefully the money will come. Nice one. I like that one. I like that one. Um, just about to finish, Pete, just uh, one more question, if I might. Where do you see yourself in five, ten years' time? Do you see yourself um, expanding yet again, uh, Aussie English, making it bigger and better? Or do you see yourself changing paths again? Good question. Who knows? I mean, it's one of those things where I keep getting my wife asked me, what would you do if you got $100 million? And I'm like, oh, I'm probably just the same thing, to be honest. Like, yeah. I would probably invest it, but I mean, <laughs> I'd probably still be wanting to help people and, you know, finding a way to do that. So, Aussie English is just my easy outlet for that. But probably in the similar sort of position, I would imagine doing the podcasting, trying to find new ways of improving the lives of other people, at least in the context of Aussie English, that is making it easier for people to integrate into life in Australia and, and make connections with other people, communicate with other people using Australian English and understanding our culture and everything. So, if I can find other ways of doing that, which I'm sure I will, um, I'll probably go down that road and potentially setting up foreign language podcasts, doing the same thing for other countries. You know, I would kill for a podcast like Aussie English that was in Portuguese which is my wife's, my wife's Brazilian, so I would kill for that kind of content. There is currently none. So, if you are a Brazilian Portuguese speaker and you want to make a podcast, please copy everything that I do and send me the, the content. <laughs> Get in touch with Pete. Fantastic. Yeah. Pete, I could, I could talk uh, with you for, for hours. Uh, thank you so much for your time, for your generosity with your story. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, hopefully, you guys out there enjoyed it as well. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. Stay, uh, stay tuned, and uh, and hope, hopefully we'll be talking to you soon, soon again. Thank you very much, everyone. My pleasure. Bye, Thank you, Martin, and inspiring Ed. Cheers, guys. <laughs>